Good afternoon, everyone. As usual, we will start with the report from Mr. Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now, at the committee's last meeting, I characterized the markets as being in risk-on, risk-off mode, trading in a highly correlated fashion based on incremental news and sentiment mostly regarding the situation in Europe. Now, in the intervening weeks, this theme has continued, with peripheral European bonds still trading at extremely elevated levels, as you can see on page three of your booklets. And particularly worrisome was this horrible German bond auction, which we had last week. Another thing that we should note is that the three-month euro-dollar basis swap has been increasing since the summer, from 20 bips in July to 146 bips currently, with 56 bips of that move happening in the last month alone. So I think we should be very wary for any signs that this funding stress is creeping across the Atlantic and affecting our financial institutions here. Mm -hmm. Now, with respect to the Treasury market, since our meeting in September when we announced Operation Twist, the yield curve has flattened, as you can see on page four, with 230s now at 268 bips, which is a six-week low. As far as implementing the maturity extension program goes, we're still conducting 19 operations per month, 13 for purchases and six for sales, and we're splitting the purchases in the 20 to 30 year sector over five operations to minimize our market impact. To enhance transparency, we're also publishing a month ahead schedule on our website. I'll need a vote of approval to approve these domestic operations. Does anyone motion to approve? I so move. Aye. Approved. Thank you for your excellent report, Mr. Martin. President Grody, would you like to begin the discussion of economic conditions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The latest GDP report showed 2% annualized growth in the third quarter. It was led by strong gains in consumption and business fixed investment. In addition, the SBFF survey forecast even stronger growth in the fourth quarter at 2.6%. Now, despite this stronger growth, I'm very concerned about the future pace of the recovery. Look on page five of your booklets. The recent rise in PCE will likely lose momentum if not matched by similar gains in income and employment. I see year over year on the graph. Remind me again, what has the trend been for month over month real personal consumption? Except for a surprising increase in October, it has been negative every month since July. Well, as you can see, I don't think this trend of consumers saving less to spend more is a successful foundation for continued recovery. Now that's a valid point. And looking away from consumers, reports from business leaders throughout my district don't seem to be a cause for much optimism. They indicate an unwillingness to hire, even if sales are strong, due to the uncertain economic and regulatory climate. So even though low interest rates have led to increased investments in capital, businesses remain unwilling to increase their declining inventories or make long-term investments in labor. President Brody, I worry that even these increases in capital investment may not continue. Although C&I lending, on page six, has performed quite well since the middle of 2010, I've seen some evidence that this trend may not continue. The last senior loan officer survey showed a deterioration in both availability of and demand for business loans. And while it's too early to establish a new trend, the board's weekly H8 release of CNI lending data peaked out the week of the second and has been declining since. I will be monitoring future releases very carefully. While that is very concerning, there are other bright spots. If you look at page seven, you can see that while the fifth district survey of manufacturing reported a decline in activity in October, expectations improved. The November Carolina survey of business activity reported similar findings across businesses in general. And nationally, the new orders component of the ISA manufacturing index showed significant expansion in October, rising to 52.4. Now this is the first time it's been above 50 in three months. Well, I agree the recent signs both well for manufacturing. And meanwhile, labor market conditions have shown similar positive signals. Businesses have been increasing their use of temporary workers as of late, so there's clearly some present demand for labor. And if we'll look on page eight, we see the trend <coughs> of jobless claims continues its healthy decline, while the employment report just revised 102,000 jobs into the picture. While current levels of job growth are still unacceptably low, I am cautiously optimistic. Well, in trying to forecast when labor market conditions might improve, I'm still looking for a bottoming in the housing market. As we all know, the housing sector has been an enormous drag on economic performance, and I don't think it's bottomed out yet. The new home sales report showed a 3.1% decline in house prices in September, and this was followed by a 0.5% decline last month. Now, if, by taking duration out of the marketplace, Operation Twist can, through the portfolio balance effect, lower long-term mortgage rates even further, leading to a boost in housing demand and so home price at least bottoming or appreciation, we should see consumer spending start to pick up because of the wealth effect and increased confidence. Additionally, homeowners can use the increased home equity 
as a substitute savings device, allowing them to channel more spending into the present. I think that's a big if, Governor James. In my opinion, any effect Operation Twist will have on housing demand will be marginal at best. The problem is significantly better suited to an effective fiscal solution, particularly one focused on mitigating the negative externalities that foreclosures produce in their neighborhoods. I mostly agree with you about Operation Twist, President Owens, but I think the negative wealth effects, which has resulted from a 25% drop in household net worth, has been one of the key factors in this downturn. In the absence of an effective fiscal solution, I think we should strongly consider further actions to improve conditions in the housing market. A large-scale MBS purchase program could be a potential option. Well, I think Governor Nolan is suggesting we begin our policy discussion. I agree. So I'd now like to call on Mr. English to update us on the Blue Book. Thank you. Let me begin by recapping our macro forecast, which is highlighted in page 9 of your booklet. Economic conditions have deteriorated since our June release, and we now expect 1.7 and 2.7 percent real GDP growth for 2011 and 2012, respectively. Unemployment is expected to be 8.6% in 2012 and isn't expected to get above or below 7% until at least after 2015. <coughs> As for the price level, market measures of short-term and medium-term inflation expectations have broadly fallen over the past few months, but we did see a large jump in short-term rates following our policy action from two meetings ago. Our official forecast for inflation is for the core PCE price index to be 1.7% in 2012. Unfortunately, these numbers are not as positive as we would normally expect in a recovery period, and there remain substantial risks even to this modest outlook. These include further deterioration in the sovereign debt crisis in Europe, and also for the potential of a significant fiscal shock from Congress, with tax cuts rolling off potentially as early as January, and also the mandatory spending cuts coming in 2013. With that being said, I'd like you to refer to page 10 of your booklets for our policy options. Are there any comments? Thank you, Mr. English. You all know that I continue to question the necessity of our decisions two meetings ago. Especially in light of recent positive data, I still believe the potential inflation risks and exit strategy complications outweigh the marginal benefits. But as for today's meeting, I'm not interested in undoing what we have previously committed to. Without strong justification, I think that could seriously damage our credibility. But I do think that we should be sending clear signals that we are willing to right act against rising inflation, should it occur. I think that the language suggested in option A does this quite effectively. And in light of recent positive data, like the 0.9 increase in the LEI, I don't think markets will interpret it as any kind of policy reversal. I think positive is a bit strong, President Owens. We've been treading water at best. Besides, I think we should be preparing for this fiscal shock from Congress should it come, because that could be a significant headwind, especially given that research has shown that our proximity to the zero lower bound increases the fiscal policy multiplier. I agree. President Owens, given the extent and duration of the unemployment problem, it behooves us to focus on that side of the mandate anyways. I think we need to focus on both sides. Furthermore, option A does not detract from the employment side. It simply reiterates our commitment to the other should conditions change. Yes, but such a language change would be premature. Given that short-term and long-term inflation expectations remain well anchored, we have room to specifically target the unemployment side of our mandate before these expectations become unmoored. Perhaps option D, an MBS purchase program, or option C, using four guidance linked to unemployment, could be a policy choice for us. Governor Nolan, with respect to forward guidance, I just find it unwise to link future policy measures to unemployment specifically when impediments to the labor market recovery may not be monetary. Recent research done in my bank characterizes much of the increase in unemployment as structural, thereby amenable not to monetary stimulus, but to structural labor reforms. Yeah, but the staff here at the board, as well as the New York Fed, has presented research on the opposite point, that specifically only about 1% of the rise in unemployment is structural. Well, I agree with President Grody. Although it is a dual mandate, Price stability and employment objectives are materially different. Inflation is ultimately a monetary phenomenon, while unemployment is largely determined by factors outside the direct control of monetary policy. Well, with all due respect to the committee, given the situation unfolding in Europe, I'm surprised we haven't had more talk about mitigating another global financial crisis. Contagion in the US financial system due to deterioration in Europe would have a significant effect on both price stability and unemployment.
I think given our role as a lender of last resort, we should be evaluating our options to provide liquidity to the financial system should this occur. Now, I applaud our moves to stress test domestic banks, but I wonder whether we shouldn't doing, be doing more preemptively, such as reinstituting tools we developed in 2008, like the term auction facility, but perhaps taking some kind of European collateral. Well, the situation in Europe is certainly tenuous, Governor James. Opening such facilities at the current time is way too soon. Swap lines and discount windows have not been drawn on nearly as much as in 2008. You can see this on page 11. Thank granted, but contagion is hardly a linear process, and we could soon see, that, soon see this borrowing snowball out of effect if um, a liquidity crisis should occur. I think at the very least we should appoint a committee to evaluate our options to forestall this. If there's nothing further, I'd like to add my thoughts. I'd first like to thank you all for holding a civil and level head discussion over some highly contentious issues. I believe one of the greatest strengths of this committee is its ability to discuss everything rationally and to consider all sides of the issues. When I look at the evidence presented today, I see an economy that's trying to reach a higher orbit that is unfortunately losing momentum. Downward revisions to GDP growth show that the growth rate was never as high as we once thought, and temporary factors from the first half of 2011 have weakened it further. As some of you mentioned earlier, this contributed to a crisis in business confidence and tenuous demand for expansion. Particularly, it is becoming remarkably difficult for businesses to justify hiring new employees. Now, obviously, the longevity of the unemployment crisis may have serious permanent effects on the economy as well as the overall labor force. I feel this has justified our strong policy response. Our position near the zero lower bound, as well as weak demand for loanable funds, limits our usual transmission mechanisms. But a considerable amount of recent literature shows that we are not out of ammunition. Now, with unemployment so high, I don't expect much inflation in the short term, but we do run the risk of seeing higher inflation in the medium term. Hence, given Mr. English's unemployment forecast, I worry that we might see inflation begin rising while the economy is still fragile. In this case, we would have to, act, we would have to activate our exit strategy before robust growth had set in, thereby risking derailing the recovery and pushing us into another recession. Also, with Operation Twist so recently enacted, I fear that approving additional accommodative policies will be interpreted as a significant deterioration of our economic outlook since our last meeting. It's these concerns which lead me to reject doing any further easing for the time being. Overall, I believe that the actions taken at the last two meetings struck the appropriate balance. I believe our actions have played out primarily as we expected, and indicators released since then don't suggest any great divergence from previous predictions. I believe we should stay the course for the time being, while carefully monitoring potential sources of economic shocks, such as Europe. My proposal is for option B, with the language proposed in the blue book. Who would like to begin the discussion? Mr. Chairman, I appreciated your opening remark. However, I do not support your recommendation, and I'm going to vote against it. As I explained earlier, I would prefer to use the language in option A. But in general, my philosophy is that we need to recognize our limits in this matter. I think the strategy that we have the best chance of implementing is to keep the inflation rate under control. We have a lot of credible experience doing this, something we can't say at all for many of these extraordinary measures. We will note your dissent in the statement. Governor Nolan? Mr. Chairman, I'll support your recommendation, but I wonder if we shouldn't be doing more. I strongly agree with you that the unemployment rate has been showing hysteresis. As you can see on page 12, around 45% of those currently unemployed have been out of a job for six months or longer. It's imperative that we avoid these long-term consequences because they affect not only our current output level, but also growth in the long run. In particular, I'm concerned about the estimates of the Nehru that have been rising throughout the crisis and are estimated to be at 6%. This is not surprising given the apparent shift in the beverage curve. It is cause for alarm and for me justifies a dovish policy stance. President Grody, would you like to weigh in as well? Thank you. And though I'm not a voting member this year, I do have my comments. Now, as you said, it is critical that we maintain our credibility in these extraordinary times. Yet when it comes to the inflation situation, we are assuming that we will be able to rein in our substantial easing without strong consequences. And I worry that our withdrawal tools that we've highlighted on page 13 just might not be as effective as we anticipate. Particularly, we must heed the lesson of the last recovery, that inflation is capable of rising even if the level of economic activity has not returned to its pre-recession trend. Headline inflation has averaged 2.7% on a year-to-year -year basis, a number that makes me uncomfortable with any additional easing. Governor James? I'll support your recommendation, Mr. Chairman. And whilst I worry about the outlook and fear we may have to ease more in the future, I do think option B is most appropriate for the time being. With one dissent, the proposal passes.
Thank you all for your participation. Thank you. Very well done. And you hit your mark on time exactly. <laughs> Any, do you have any questions before I start? Um, no. Sorry. Sorry. Well, um, that was a good presentation, very thorough. Um, I want to start by asking about uh, some of the uh, some of the some of the unconventional tools that uh, that the central bank can use or or might use uh, when its interest rate policy tool is, is at its at its at or near its zero lower bound. Um, looks like you've got kind of a description of those on, on page 13. So uh, I want to give you an opportunity to uh, to expand on on that on that description or that list uh, by uh, by by describing by describing what these tools are, uh, how they how they work, the mechanism through which they're uh, they're intended to to affect the economy and 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 the Fed's you know, the Fed's objectives, and um, and some of the uh, some of the ways in which we uh, we should think about weighing the benefits and drawbacks of each of these specific um, tools. So I'll talk about one of the one of the first areas we could look at is the use of forward guidance. One of the um, purposes of forward guidance is to better communicate with the financial market participants. And so why this is important is um, so one thing from a volatility from a policy action standpoint, if the market understands what the <coughs> Fed's going to do, we might not see as much volatility um, based on an action. And then also, I think it helps them to give them more um, control over inflation expectations. Um, because the market knows more about what the Fed's going to do. And then also, because of that, it's also going to help them to give them more leverage over long-term um, interest rates. A potential drawback for using forward guidance is, um, is the idea it really um, hampers their hands and credibility standpoints. If they don't actually do what they say they're going to do, they could lose a lot of credibility going forward. And that's been one of the big things about how they've been able to control um, um, inflation expectations is due to their credibility. Give me an example. Be, be more specific and give me an example of um, of a type of forward guidance and and how that credibility problem might arise. Yeah, Russ, Russ could so, so there are certain different kinds they could use, and you could use, say, rule based forward guidance. So you could set a specific target that the Fed is looking for. So we mentioned unemployment. You could do nominal GDP. You could look at an interest rate level where you define, you know, maybe core inflation rate the Fed is willing to tolerate, and that would give the market. A very clear understanding that inflation rate is going to stay low, not just to a specific date, but until one of these target objectives is met or until a trigger is reached. Um, you know, there are certain drawbacks with each one. The employment one, as we mentioned, we worry that you can observe an inflation gap, but it's very hard to directly observe an employment gap. And so if that's not a monetary phenomenon without some kind of inflation cap and you're trying to target unemployment, you could see inflation expectations completely unmoored. And so we think, you know, a middle ground between those might be a nominal GDP target, which targets both sides of the mandate. Or, you know, and that would essentially, some people said, sugarcoat an inflation target, because it might be easier to sell politically in terms of a um, kind of transparency standpoint. Another one is, um, in the summary of economic um, projections, you, we have uh, a forecast of where we expect interest rates or GDP or unemployment to go forward. But the problem with that is it's um, conditioned on appropriate monetary policy of the discretion of the people that are voting. And so the big question for the market participant standpoint is what actually is accommodative or appropriate monetary policy. So. Um, Given what these assumptions based on, given that to the market would help them better understand how they expect unemployment to get to whatever percentage it is, or inflation, or GDP. I think another answer, and this uh, isn't in on page 13, but it's relevant to your question, talking about being stuck at the zero lower bound. It's important to note that current consumption and investment sp and investment is not just reflective of current short-term nominal interest rates, but the expectation of future short-term nominal interest rates. So the Federal Reserve can credibly commit to lowering uh, or to making short-term nominal interest in the future lower than what the market currently expects, that can be accommodative in the present. And then along the lines of actions beyond simply forward guidance and altering expectations, um, asset purchase programs such as an MBS purchase program would act through lowering the effective mortgage rate. Um, the results we would intend to see there 
is that by lowering the mortgage rate, it one induces marginal home buyers who are basically on the fence about buying a new house to push them in and increase demand for houses, but also to allow people to refinance at a lower rate, um, particularly with the introduction of HARP, where people who are underwater with their house, as long as they are not over 125%, um, there will, they will now be allowed to refinance. So if we allow them to refinance at a new lower rate, we can essentially ease some of their financial constraints. Um, along those lines, an uh, asset treasury purchase program, um, such as a potential QE3, um, would try to target long-term interest rates. Um, obviously, lowering long-term interest rates uh, may also help mortgages by reducing long-term rates but also reducing the rates there essentially makes investment easier for corporations because it would likely reduce um, rates on corporate bonds or other issuances of business debt and allow them to essentially invest in capital more cheaply or expand their businesses more cheaply. And just one thing to add on, although I know we spent a long time on this question, we tend to focus on the monetary tools available to the Fed in order to try and spur growth. And Sean mentioned HARP, and one thing that we were debating is the potential for the Fed to use its role as a regulator of systemic risk to induce participants in the mortgage market, mortgage underwriters, to actually allow these loans to be refinanced, because we've seen mention of certain structural impediments, even with HARP, where mortgage refinances are unwilling to un re-underwrite their loans, even though that would seem to lower the risk of a default. And we wonder whether the Fed might be able to use its uh, position as a regulator to try and speed that process, because obviously we can't implement fiscal policy, but perhaps we can allow um, its implementation to be smoother and so get more of these estimated 4 million uh, households who are eligible for HARP refinanced. Okay. Um, in your answers, you talked a bit about inflation and unemployment, and there's been a lot of discussion as to whether or not Federal Reserve should set an explicit inflation target given our dual mandate, do you think the Fed should set an explicit target for inflation and or unemployment? And if such a target were set, how should um, monetary policy deal with variations from those targets? Um, so first, to deal with the combination, um, so essentially trying to either target inflation mixed with a measure of unemployment or people, some people have been proposing a nominal GDP target, which would essentially incorporate both factors. Um, one significant logistical issue that we see coming forth is that they're, they're fairly quantifiable means of determining the inflation results of a given monetary policy, but determining its effects quantitatively on an unemployment would be much more variable. So if you're trying to reach an explicit target, there's a, I mean, there's a fundamental question how do you determine what is the appropriate asset purchase or the appropriate amount of any policy to induce the increase in nominal GDP that you need to see, or if you're targeting explicitly a combination of inflation and unemployment, if you know what, how it will affect inflation, how do you know its exact ramifications on unemployment? And will you run to an issue where you have to act, then react to compensate for overmeasures or undermeasures? Um, I think Russell can also expand on the nominal GDP or interest rate target. Well, sure. The, um, and we kind of alluded to this earlier, it's hard to measure that employment gap. It's easier to measure the inflation gap. And so your worry is that you know, if you have the employment target, you are more long-term inflationary expectations. We don't see that necessarily with the nominal GDP target to the same extent because you have an automatic reactive mechanism whereby you know, if inflation is not as high as you would expect it to be, you have more easing to help the employment side. If you see real GDP growth and inflation on top of that, then you cut down to reduce the inflation. And so because it has that reactive mechanism, we don't think you have run the risk of unmooring it to the same extent. And inflation takes us even further. If you just have a specific inflation target, then we don't run the risk of uh, unmooring our inflation expectations. And as we've noted in our, in our presentation, we have a lot of credible experience in the Federal Reserve of managing inflation policy very well, and that's one thing that they've worked very hard to maintain, and we don't want to lose that credibility. But regarding a specific inflation target, basically what's happening there is the Fed is putting their credibility on the table. We're going to say we're going to have inflation there. And given they have pretty good credibility, that may work. But if they miss the target, they suddenly just lost a lot of credibility. So it's a bit of a gamble to go with a strict inflation target. Um, and along to add along the lines of expectations, 
I would see a predominant benefit of an inflation target would be if you were either trying to promote increased inflation or if you were trying to rein in inflation. So uh, if you were in a separate scenario where inflation is rampant, if you can make a strong, credible claim that you will target 2%, 2.5%, you can not only help through your direct policies rein in inflation, but try to control expectations. For the Fed, I don't see that being much of a benefit because inflation expectations have remained well anchored. Um, when we look at expectations despite accommodative policies, people seem to feel that the exit strategy detailed is credible. And we haven't seen a jump in the inflation people see. So it seems that despite the fact that there is not an explicit inflation target, people are confident that the Fed will keep inflation essentially around 2%. So I don't see it providing much of a benefit in terms of managing expectations. And it comes with its inherent contrast that you tie your hands, forcing yourself to essentially contract the moment you exceed that, even if you haven't met the unemployment target, or to ease the moment you drop below it, even if you think things are overheating. And I think just to elaborate on Sean's point where he says tie your hands, the last part of your question was how would the Fed adapt to unusual circumstances if you had set this forward guidance? And we're not convinced that there is a substan substantial change if you set an inflation target from the Fed's current policy of trying to keep inflation low. We think, given the credibility the Fed has, there's almost a soft inflation target there already. But the benefit you get is you haven't tied your hands to the extent that if there is some large spike in inflation, you automatically have to react because inflationary pressures can differ. And you might want to react differently depending what the inflationary pressure is, whether this is just some kind of supply shock and you're looking at headline and you know we saw a missile base in Iran get blown up yesterday and we're worried that potentially there could be some kind of oil shock in the Middle East, you don't then necessarily want to start tightening because you have inflation and you set it as a target. And I think if the Fed maintains its soft target, they, have, they don't lose their credibility when they react to extraordinary events. And we don't see much marginal benefit from an inflation target given that you tie your hands in a very uncertain world. But one way the Fed could make the inflation target a bit more fluid would actually be go with a price level target, which sort of runs the equivalent of a long run inflation target, where if you miss it, you're promising higher inflation in the future, which in this case now, if we had a price level target, we would be promising some higher inflation now to get us back up to that, and then inflation would stabilize. Right. And then, sorry, this is a long answer, but um, just the one downside that that brings to it is that it brings some instability. Even though it brings stability to long-term inflation rates, it brings instability to short-term rates, which again has that effect on inflation expectations because you're essentially stating that if we hit 1% on a given year, the following year we'll attempt to reach 3 to 3.5% 3 to compensate around 2%. And what that essentially does is it creates some uncertainty of what the inflation rates will be going forward. Um, our opinion is that the low inflation rates we see are predominantly an artifact of the fact that the Fed has strongly committed to and delivered in low inflation rates mm -hmm. around 2%. And that's what people see going forward. And that the moment that you start actively stating that you will be altering that year to year, you throw that up for... Okay. We have one more question. We're going to move on to yeah, one more question. Fun. You'll yeah. note that you have only two minutes okay. to use this last <laughs> question, so be as focused as you can. Um, you mentioned Europe and the crisis there <clears throat> in your discussion. I'd like to invite you to elaborate on this further. And specifically, I'd like you to address two separate related questions. First is, what is the nature of the crisis in Europe? And secondly, what are the potential implications for the US? OK, I think to broadly jump in, and my teammate members can elaborate and try and do this quickly. First of all, you've it's a confidence issue. It's a liquidity issue. Um, we think that's particularly evident in the appetite for EFSF bonds where we think that effectively you're buying French and German guarantees, and yet the appetite doesn't seem to be there. Um, and so we wonder you know, if the Federal Reserve might consider actually stepping in and <coughs> announcing to the market they're going to buy $100 billion of EFSF bonds, and that could restore confidence. Because once confidence starts to spiral, we talked about contagion. We talked about the swap lines being used and how that can snowball in a liquidity crisis. And what we worry is that there's just this flight um, into cash and hard assets because people are worried about the um, ability of sovereigns to meet um, their obligations. As far as impacting the US, we see primarily um, worries about financial contagion. You know, there's $4 trillion of gross exposure from US banks to European financial institutions. And so if people start getting worried about counterparty risk a la 2008, you could see a tightening of credit here in the US. Um, longer term, you worry about a European recession. 
13% of US GDP is exports, 5% of those go to Europe, so that seems small, but there's a trigger with China and Japan. Europe is a very large player in the global economy, so if you see a European recession induce a hard landing in China, that could hurt us.